Columbia, Houston, we're looking at our uh, payload bay camera, and it looks like a lot of moonlight glinting off the ocean, a whole sparkling uh, bed of diamonds out there. Is that a, a real picture, or are we just getting some video fuzz? That's a great combination of the moonlight and the ice and the clouds. And it's a combination of uh, moonlight making those ice crystals sparkle and maybe as well as some of the, the sun starting to come up on the horizon. Well, thanks for the picture. is now visible on the uh, far left-hand side of the screen, about, about an inch from the bottom of this particular picture. And there were also a number of shooting stars in that view. The uh, camera has now moved to a point Okay, the Mir space station is the small flashing light in the center, about an inch from the left-hand side of the screen. It's slowly... It is slowly moving closer to the left-hand side and is a very, it has a very light flashing to it. Thank <laughs> you. 
see the sunlight now, it's like a bright spot at the end of the tether, and on the other end, the lower end, there's also a relatively bright spot, which is maybe an accumulation of the tether. And we are downlinking camera delta now. Okay, we copied and uh, understand uh, as you're viewing it on the monitor, the uh, satellite is at the top of the tether. That's correct. Columbia. Bravo. We had the camera Bravo constantly on the tether. Unfortunately, we don't see the tip of the boom, but uh, in a few seconds, you'll see the tether break. And this one, of course, was uh, not attended. It just recorded. It could not be bumped either, so it uh, will record steadily the whole uh, break and uh, coil back of the tether. Copy, Claude. Again, this is a view of the satellite. Well, if it had to break, it did it in the right place. Columbia and the satellite now 77 nautical miles apart. Again, that call reporting that uh, the crew can see the tether and uh, see the satellite. To, that it's beautiful. This view uh, showing a. Uh, The satellite, again, uh, just moving into sunrise. 81 nautical miles now from Columbia. Franklin, uh, we see a long line, a couple of star-like things, and a lot of things swimming in the foreground. Can you describe what you're seeing? Well, the long line is, uh, is a tether, um, and uh, there's a little bit of debris that uh, kind of flies with us, and uh, it's uh, illuminated by the sun at such low angles. So this is just a lot of stray light and it's getting washed out uh, quickly, but uh, Claude is trying to do a, a quick, uh, good job here adjusting the cameras. Copy that. You know that description by the crew, this is uh, the tether in the satellite, uh, the satellite with 12, approximately 12 miles of tether still attached to it. Columbia and the satellite are now just passing over 
the west coast of uh, northern Africa. The two spacecraft are now 90 nautical miles apart. Controllers for the satellite uh, did have communications uh, with it uh, during the close pass uh, between Columbia and the satellite. Columbia Houston, that's a much better view, uh, a lot more contrast visible. And how wide uh, does that tether appear to be? We, we, it seems to resemble a a much wider strand than we'd expect. Can you describe which way the, uh, the satellite is visible on that uh, strand? Satellite to now 100 nautical miles. Charlie, completely unzoomed, and uh, you see the full extent of the tether. I try to adjust the focus, but I can't get better than that. Okay, Claude. Thank you. Better zoom in now. should mirror exactly what she's doing on the inside. Okay. Right now, the handle is installed with the tab in the unlocked position. I'm going to rotate the tab to the locked position now, if you're ready. We're ready. Okay, we are fully seated in the locked position. Okay, Tammy, we didn't see any uh, any motion on the outside. Uh, if you would, go ahead and uh, move it back to the unlocked. Okay, I'm pulling back to the unlocked, and again, it's only going about uh, three-quarters of the way. will not fly flat and will not see it, as I mentioned earlier. And, and Tammy, uh, if, if you could, simultaneous with trying to put it in the unlocked position, if you would move the handle a little bit back and forth. Okay, and we can see the handle moving on the outside. Okay, and uh, but any indication that the lock is being actuated? No, we can't. Uh, we can't see any indication of that, and, and it just may be a bad angle and too dark. Amidst the two and a half thousand hours of NASA footage recorded by Martin Stubbs, we have seen countless examples of the spheres, the first space phenomenon. But until now, few have ever come across, least of all seen described, what has been labelled the second space phenomenon. Those that have, have been left speechless, including eminent scientists, astrophysicists and, as we have learned, highly placed figures within the Canadian Space Agency. Someone who was prepared to comment publicly after being shown less than five minutes of the footage was Guido Negro, director of the SETI radio telescope at Golden Grave Observatory in Western Australia. What, we asked, did he make of it all? Well, I was very well impressed, and not only myself, also other people that were looking at. And because this time we are not talking about footage taken off from some home movie camera, but someone that actually was flying a space shuttle, so automatically that gave us the fact that the picture must have been real, genuine. Yeah. genuine. Well, I was very well impressed. And maybe this will prove that there is something else that we are not aware of, at least officially. If the footage that we saw came to be true and really are showing an alien spacecraft or something like that, 
I say that if there is a cover-up, the, the, the people who are doing this cover-up are an enemy of the entire third race because we are not children and we must know if and we must know the truth. It doesn't matter if there are people that are not, they don't know how to handle the truth. Well, the majority of us will, and if there is a cover-up, I think it's time that the cover-up goes. Guido could have easily dismissed this sampling as ice crystals at best, or errant nonsense at worst. The fact that he chose to do neither is symbolic, perhaps, of the potential importance both he and a great many others attached to the footage. The owners surely now rest with people like Guido and others elsewhere in the scientific community to determine whether or not the second space phenomena is a genuine phenomenon. And were that proven to be the case, two burning questions would need to be addressed. Is it extraterrestrial? And is it intelligent? If the answer to either is deemed yes, we could have arrived at an historic moment. For Martin Stubbs, it would be the vindication of what he and millions like him have always maintained, that we are not alone in the universe. His, after all, was a chance discovery, a fleeting glimpse of something that sped across his television monitor that most would fail to notice. He focused on that. He looked for more of the same, under different conditions, and found them in abundance. But found what exactly? Some of the greatest scientific discoveries known to man have often been born from chance events. But is it remotely conceivable that one of the greatest discoveries of all time could have been similarly unearthed by a humble cable TV manager operating out of a small community station in Vancouver? History will surely go on to determine the truth, provided, that is, Others within the scientific community are equally prepared to explore the limitless possibilities now before them. But who among them will be courageous enough, ambitious enough, to step forward and examine this evidence? There will be many who will choose to ignore it, blinded by self-imposed scientific dogma and bland indifference towards all who champion the extraterrestrial hypotheses. But those that do express an interest may well find themselves embarking upon one of the greatest scientific treks of all time. I can't explain it because I don't th really think that's my job right now. I'm merely a person who's gathering grains of salt together and putting them in front of you. It's as if you have a carpet and you throw, you have a handful of salt and you throw the salt on the carpet you look and you don't think there's any salt there but when you gather it up put it back in your hand you have something 